All righty, folks. Welcome back to the Mushing Alaska's coverage of the 2024 Iditarod. It's day five and super stoked for yet another exciting guest. Um, before I introduce our guest, just want to do a couple of quick updates. Uh, in terms of Sean, he is now currently in Cripple. So if any of you guys are on the insider and tuning in, um, you know, he's been moving the mic or he's been moving the camera around and interacting with people on the chat and zooming in and out. So, um, you can certainly maybe see him there and even possibly try to chat with him through that chat feature. Uh, so I just want to give an update there. I also, I have not really done much to ask you guys to subscribe to our page on YouTube, but we're incredibly close to a goal that we have. And it would be awesome if you guys wouldn't mind subscribing. Um, outside of that, I also want to mention one last thing, and that is some of you have reached out and asked if there's a way to support our cause. And so the other day I set up a little way to accept donations if that's what you're into. Um, you'll see that in the description of this. You'll see it in the little ticker that I have in the bottom. Uh, but I wanted to thank the first person to, to uh, send us a donation, uh, Philip. I really, really appreciate that. That was really kind of you to do that. And moving on, I'd like to welcome in our next guest. He is a 12-time Iditarod veteran, born in Alaska, now residing in Wisconsin with two beautiful boys. He's here to share his perspective and breakdown of the 2024 Iditarod. Um, I'm excited to talk to him because he's got five top 10 finishes. He's got quite a few notable awards under his belt, including the fastest time from safety to Nome in both 2015 and 19 and the Dorothy G. Page Halfway Award. Allow me to introduce you our guest today, Mr. Wade Mars. Welcome on today, sir. How are you? I'm doing good. And yourself? I can't complain, sir. I can't complain. Super excited about where we are in the race and how things are starting to develop and shake up, especially uh, after the 24 hours. Most people have now pretty much completed their 24 hours or in the process of doing it. Um, so super excited to hear your breakdown. And uh, the first thing, though, before we get to that, I just want to ask, you know, it's your first time in I think it's like 14 or 15 years being home this time of the year. Um, do you have a sense, an itch to be out there? Are you happy you're home right now? What, what's going through your mind? Yeah, a little bit of both. <laughs> Definitely. Um, missing the race, missing the people on the trail for sure. <laughs> missing the being competitive. Um, but nice to be here with the kids and the wife and, and, uh, enjoying watching and doing a little commentation of our own and stuff. So it's been yeah, awesome. Yeah. yeah. And I have to say, uh, I'm sure those of you who follow Wade clearly know that him and his wife, Sophia have been doing some daily updates as well. And if you haven't tuned in, you really need to, they do a really good job. Um, I love the, the dynamic between the two of you. It's, you've got like this cute, playful thing going and, uh, and, uh, you know, if, in the future, you're not doing the Iditarod. You should content, consider to continue doing that. But for the record, Sophia is the star. I just got to throw it out there. <laughs> oh, absolutely. <laughs> so um, I have some notes, but before we hit my notes, I'm just curious, like, off the top, what is standing out to you about Iditarod 2024? Yeah, it's pretty wild. I... I um... I'm excited and really happy to see that Travis is out in front and it's crazy that he's so far out in front. That's, that's pretty awesome. Um, of course, you know, Jesse Holmes taking his eight and stuff and Ryan, so they'll gain a little time back on him later, but yeah, it's interesting. Cool to see. Yeah. I've, uh, you know, I guess you, maybe you can provide a little bit of background. Bless you. Um, but 
you and Travis have a pretty tight relationship, right? Uh, and, and also I've noticed Ryan is pretty openly rooting for Travis as well. He mentioned that in one of his videos, I noticed that he was, he was like, well, I'm hoping to win, but I'm really rooting on Travis too. Um, but you guys have like, you guys kind of grew up together or at least in the same area. Can you kind of tell, tell those, uh, about your relationship with him? Yeah. Um, well, Ryan and I grew up right down the road from each other. I met Travis junior mushing in, uh, the, when did I meet him in the Cantwell classic, um, race. And then we raced against each other for a couple years before I started doing Iditarod. Um, he ended up with a couple of my junior dogs to race with in his last year of junior, I did junior racing. And then, um, you know, we just became pretty good friends and started training together. We've trained together a lot over the years. And, and, uh, you know, I've raced his team in dog races. He's raced my team in dog races. So yeah, we've, we've become pretty good friends over the years for sure. Nice. Nice. And, um, some of the dogs that you, uh, you, he has some of your dogs on his team. Is that right? Uh, not Travis. Travis says, uh, all of his own dogs. Ryan has some of my dogs on his team. And then Jason Mackey has some of my dogs on his team as well. Got you. Got you. Um, so one thing that I wanted to do is provide a little, uh, background on, I've got some Intel from one of, I'm just going to say an inside source. All right. And, uh, <laughs> Wade and I were kind of chatting about this a little bit on the front end. But I wanted to just bring it up, and I think that those of you who are watching will find some of this information kind of interesting. It's a, a little bit of more details, and I, I swear, I thought this moose story was going to end like after a day or two, and it's just like every day we, we are continuing to talk about it. But I do find that this information is really interesting to hear this perspective. So um, we saw the moose that Dallas shot and it was already back to Squenna and getting field dressed to distribute to the community. It looked to be in great shape as the rumor is he killed it with one shot to the head neck area. The meat, all the meat was salvageable. Um, we also got to see the scene of the crime and it was close to as bad of a spot to run into a moose as you could find downhill blind corner around a massive tree. His lead dogs would have been tangled with the moose without him really being able to even see it. The trail was tight. There was absolutely no way he could have gone around. However, there was enough room to park his team and plenty of trees to tie off to, so not gunning the moose is still indefensible. Uh, so I wanted to share that with you all. And Wade, now that you've heard that, I'm, I'm interested to hear your perspective Knowing what we know, uh, I'm sure most of you have hopefully gotten a chance to watch um, Dallas's interview. I forget the checkpoint, but he has like a 10 minute interview where he talks about what happened. Um, but with all that being said, Wade, I'm curious just to get your opinion on things on that. Yeah, I mean, uh, it's a hard situation, you know, with the dogs you know, your mind's on the dogs, your mind's on the moose, your mind's on your race. So you, you're kind of being pulled in a bunch of different directions. You've already lost time. Uh, it would have been an early stop for him on his camp, etc. He was worried about his dog that was in a sled. If you've watched the video, you've already heard most of this. So, um, but even Dallas agreed that I did rod made the right choice, um, in, in giving the penalty. So, you can't, you can't kind of deny both of them. <laughs> um, yeah, Didrod said not a good job. Dallas said, yeah, I didn't do a good job, but I totally understand where he's coming from. That his mind was in a different place with the dogs and with the race and everything else, and he was probably kind of in shock. I don't know if you've ever hunted, but um, Travis and I actually, we went hunting a couple years ago together. We shot our first mooses, moose together. And uh, we shot two moose within 15, 15 feet of each other. And both of us were just kind of losing our minds. Um, and you, you kind of go into a blank space when you're in that ad adrenaline rush. It's, it's something different and something new, especially when you're um, 
when you're on a dog team, I'm sure it's even even more so hectic and crazy. So I can see where he, he made the mistake and left without doing the full job. Um, but again, him and the Iditarod agreed that it wasn't sufficient enough. So I can't help but to agree with them on that for sure. Sure. Yeah, I mean, it's got to be um, a tough situation for all involved, whether you're Dallas in that situation. I'm sure his adrenaline was just sky high. And, you know, um, I have not been hunting, but I can only imagine that it is uh, there's some some thrills. And, um, yeah, I'm sure it's quite a thing. Um, so, yeah, it, it was just interesting to hear that perspective from Dallas. And, you know, he kind of owned up to things and. You know, he agreed that it wasn't the best, but he also explained himself. And so I think that was really great to hear that. And um, hopefully, you know, there's been a lot of conversation around this topic and a lot of it's been speculation. Um, hopefully we can kind of put a little bit of that to rest now that we've we've heard the information we've heard from him and, you know, some of that that I just shared from uh, from the inside source. So. Um, so, yeah, I don't yeah, know if yet have anything else to add on this topic before we kind of maybe try to put it to rest. The only one thing that I'll say is, you know, we get mad when, when somebody creates a penalty or, you know, in, has a penalty infraction and it's not dealt with. And then we get mad when somebody has a penalty infraction and it is dealt with. So puts I did around in a hard spot of trying to decide when to say penalty and when not to. So, um, but I'm, I'm happy to see that they they didn't favor him and not penalize him when he did it. Um, but it's it's crazy to see the difference it's going to make in the finish. Uh, I think, like I said in my video, if you haven't watched it, this is Dallas CV we're talking about. If you saw his team coming into Ruby, they looked like beasts. And um, I look for him to still go for that win and and. I just hope he keeps his head in the game and, and keeps fighting for it because uh, he's definitely not out of the situation yet, for sure, of winning. Yeah, so I'm, uh, I'm wondering if you can give us a little breakdown of what you're seeing there at the top of the pack. You know, as, as it is right now, as we're recording, um, we've got Travis in the lead. He's running. He's uh, five. Let me make sure I'm up to date on this. Oh, it looks like he just took a rest, but uh, he's mile 528, uh, and he's just outside of Ruby, or not just outside of Ruby. He's on his way to Galena. Um, so yeah, I mean, he's still he's he's got his eight. If he stops shy of Galena, um, do you see him going from where he's going to Nolato to hit that eight hour, or do you think he's on his way to Caltag? Uh, I think he'll continue all the way on to Galena, would be my guess. Um, and I don't know if he'll shut down for eight there or continue on. Um, either way, it sets him up really well for a long run coming off of his eight if he needs it or wants it. I think that he took a risk move of jumping out in front. That's a risky move, but, you know, I've never won the race, so maybe that's the risky move it takes to win the race. And you know, sitting back and relaxing is a risky move as well. Uh, letting people get too close to you. So uh, as of now, I look for him to go straight to Galena. The trails must be nice. He's moving fast. As last time I saw, he's you know moving over eight miles an hour, closer to nine, it seems like, um, when you do the math from when he left and how far he's gotten. So so the trail must be nice leaving Ruby. So I, I look for him to continue moving for his eight if everything's shaken down well, you know. Obviously, he'll look at the dogs and make that judgment call if he if he needs to recover them or whatever and, and Galena. So. Yeah, and I'm loving, uh, you know, Matt Hall. Last year, he had a great second half of the race, and it's great to see yeah. him up there in second. He's uh, he's currently running. He's, he's past Ruby just a few miles. He's, you know, over eight miles an hour, and um, – I'm I'm curious to to see or hear if you have any any thoughts on his, how his race is is um, shaping up from your perspective. Yeah, he's he's been sitting back a little ways, which you know, being a little conservative, 
but he's one of those types of mushers. Like last year, him and I were together in Caltech, and he took off and ended up fourth, and I ended up tenth. So he has that kind of type of dog team that can finish the race, a little bit older guys and that are uh, very steady. And I think he trains that way as well. So I look for him to make a really strong push to the finish line. going to be hard to beat that team for sure. And then uh, I guess in, in terms of who's at the front, more so at the front of the pack than others, um, Nick is in at third place right now, but he's he's in the middle of his 24-hour. Uh, I'm wondering yeah. if you can just break down that move he did, getting all the way to Ruby. You know, um, for me, I, I, I've only been following the yeah, Iditarod for about five or six years now with, through Sean. But I don't feel like we see. I don't feel like we see much uh, in terms of stopping in Ruby. Um, you know, it, it, is this like a classic Nick's pulling a Nick? Is this? Uh, I mean, I know he talked about like he's had this plan for two years or whatever. But um, I mean, is he setting himself up to to be still in contention after that, or do you feel like he's maybe put himself a little bit at a disadvantage? Yeah, I think he's definitely a disadvantage right now. I haven't done the math to see exactly how far behind he's going to be, but he's going to be quite a ways behind. Uh, you have to think about some of these teams that are sitting in Ruby or taking their eight, and they're still going to leave ahead of him, and then he'll have an eight later on. So he's quite a ways behind. But we did see Jeff King leave, you know, Jeff King 24 in Ruby one year. I think he was seven or eight hours behind Dallas, and he ended up getting to White Mountain six hours ahead of Dallas. Um, and I think that was 2014 when he scratched on the way to safety. So, I mean, that was a 13 hour, he made up 13 hours on the leader from Ruby to the, to white mountain that year, Jeff did. So it's not impossible to make up a lot of time in that stretch and, and Ruby and Nick's probably about that far behind, maybe a little bit more. So it is possible for him to come up quite a bit still. I don't know that that's what Nick's looking at. I, I feel like Nick's just hanging back this year, having fun, went up to Ruby to get the dinner. That's that's my opinion at the moment. But uh, um, He looked pretty happy wrong. with that meal. <laughs> it looks really, yeah, it looked really did, nice. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Um, you, you, you've had that meal before, correct? I have not had that meal before. No, the the Dorothy Page doesn't give you that. Um, you get is that that's no. a gold award, reward? Yeah, the Dorothy G Page Award is gold, three thousand okay. dollars gold nugget. Um, yeah, it was first to Ruby one year, but it was on the Fairbanks route, so it was a different different award that year. It was a Spirit Award, which is normally given in McGrath. Okay, so. Yep. So is there a um are you avoiding trying to get that that meal cuz usually <laughs> it and maybe you I tell me if I'm wrong but most of the time whoever gets gets that meal is not going to win the race. Uh in the past years you're right. Yes, but I believe looking back a little ways Lance Mackey has won both the meal and the race before. Wow. Wow. So it's been done for sure. It's been done, but you're you're not like, oh, I, I'm sure the idea of a nice meal sounds nice when you're out there, um, yeah. but it, it, you're probably like, hey, I, I'm still trying to win one of these. I want to, uh, you know, more concerned right. with your with your placing than maybe the the meal, perhaps. Absolutely. Yes. Yep. Um, I like that you have that. That's your opinion, and I think that's probably pretty fair. <laughs> <laughs> so um all right uh there's a couple more individual mushers that i just want to ask you about and get your opinion on um next person being jesse holmes and you know obviously he had a pretty strong start in the first few days and then um seemed like there was a kind of like a chink in the armor and he it seems like he kind of dialed things back but he really has kind of come on strong or at least he looks like the my the speed is there from from what I've seen. Um, do you think he's still a name that is 
uh, you know, a p potential to win the race, or is he still a little bit too far back? No, I think, I think he's right there. He's in contention for sure. Um, he did dial back before his 24, uh, depends on how, how much he took out of them before he dialed back and how much they regained from dialing back. Um, he did push though after his 24 he has pushed to get right back up into the front part there and i can't remember what he came into cripple in third there or uh, sorry ruby in third yep. um not too far behind travis so he did get right back on the gas again and, and get up there so it'll be interesting to see if that uh chink shows back up or if he took care of that issue and he's rock and roll it now with a strong dog team and it and it holds up we'll see what happens here yeah you know um just kind of recalling to last year's race i feel like uh kind of getting there to the coast he he had to kind of dial things back but then same thing he, he was able to have them finish really really strong and you know i'm curious i know that we hear a lot about out of a 24 maybe you might initially have that same speed you had before but it's usually pretty hard to maintain that. Um, but man, it, you know, I don't know what kind of magic he's doing, but uh, yeah, it seems like the dogs have actually kind of picked it back up to where they were in the first part of the race. They have, yeah. He did a good job dialing back early enough, it seems like, and and recovered on his 24 and is doing really well again. So as long as he, he's smart enough to keep it at a pace where he doesn't have to redial again. Um, he could be right there for sure. Nice. Nice. And so the <laughs> next person that I was going to ask you about, um, I want to give a shout out to the ladies page page drove yeah. me in sixth place right now. Uh, granted there yeah. is, is a, a bottleneck of people there in the Ruby checkpoint, but, um, I have not spent a lot of time breaking down and analyzing her race yet. And I'm just curious if you've had a chance just to kind of look at her, if there's anything that's standing out to you about how she's put herself in this position. Yeah, she's ran a very smart race. She was very conservative at the first part, kept her speed high and that's, you know, trickled over to now. She's still keeping her speed high. She's obviously got on the gas a little bit, but not way too hard. So, uh, sometimes that speed can take a little bit out of you on um, being able to keep pushing the gas. But if she, if that dog team's strong, she has the speed to to catch a lot of people. And I look for her to have a really strong finish for sure. Nice, nice. Um, so the one thing I did want to ask you, just in general, um, you know, once the mushers get to Ruby they're now on uh, the river now. And in terms of like these next checkpoints, Galena, Nolato, Caltag, are, is the terrain very similar because they're on the river or is there any, like, is there one run there that might be a little bit different than the other? Can you kind of talk a little bit about the, the terrain on this part, this section of the race? Yeah, I mean, the terrain is all about the same. Like like you said, you're running on the river. Some spots get hit with a little more wind than others. Um, so you might hit some some really wind-drifted areas or something like that. I know a couple days ago the wind was blowing really hard outside of Ruby, creating whiteout conditions, which that snow must have hardened right up because of the way Travis is moving. So um, it seems like that, that played in their favor rather than in in a detriment to the trail this time. Uh, so that's really good. And then <clears throat> the other big thing on the river is time of day. So you're out in the wide open, the river's three to four miles wide. If it's middle of the day, hot, sun's beating down, that can make a big difference on your run through there. Um, and then if it's windy while you're moving, the wind can really slam you. The nice thing about the Northern route is it the wind is at your back so it's not blowing right in your face trying to stop you so that's pretty nice okay um and actually i just noticed that it looks like travis was maybe taking like a little micro break or something he's green again and looks like he's as you were saying on his way into galena so um okay 
just giving you that update there um yeah i've seen the trackers do quite a bit of little glitches like that where it looks like someone's about to take a break and then 15 minutes later it updates and they're ways up the trail so um there's definitely been a few of those this year that maybe they're every year but i've, I've definitely noticed this yeah. yes uh you probably don't notice it until now because you're out there in the race yeah. but yeah there's usually a couple glitches and like you go on social media and people are up in arms like wait what happened and you know everyone starts to speculate and naturally go yeah. to the worst thing uh, thing possible um i do know that i think i saw something that ruby something about the ruby area like they always have issues with the uh, trackers over there or something um i did watch a i forget what checkpoint it was but it was one of the insider videos and um and maybe you can kind of give us some insight on this as well um one of the mushers was just coming through the checkpoint but they were switching out the gps tracker i get. i guess i didn't realize that they're switching those out at is that at every checkpoint or is that at some of the checkpoints yeah, I don't know if they're switching them out or if they're just putting new batteries in them. Okay. Um, e either way, uh, I don't, I'm not sure on that. I think they just take them out, put new batteries in. Okay. But so that then I guess that's something they do at every checkpoint, though? Uh, no, probably three, four times throughout the race. Okay. Okay. Yeah. Um, right on. So, um,. You know, for those at the front, is there, you know, str what is, do you feel like the strategy is to hit this next eight hour mandatory? Um, you know, we kind of talked about it with Travis and you thought maybe it's going to be Galena or maybe it goes on. Um, but, you know, with uh, most of the mushers have stopped in Ruby, so let's just take that hypothetical. If you're a musher that's breaking in Ruby, where do you like, what are the different scenarios that you see for some of those people in their eight hours? Yeah. I mean, some of them are hitting eight because they need it and they need the little reset. Some of them are hitting eight because they are trying to keep that higher pace, higher energy dog team. Um, so there's kind of both of those aspects to, uh, mixed in there. Uh, and then, you know, some of them are setting up for blowing through checkpoints. You know, I would look for Jesse Holmes to probably go through Ruby a little ways in camp and then go all the way to Caltag or something like that. And getting an eight, having a charged up dog team to make a move like that is a good idea. Um, and then some of them will just play it safe and, go checkpoint to checkpoint down the river so um is there like if you're trying to win the race is there one of those checkpoints that you feel is more strategically better to take that eight hour than the other um i know that and we were talking earlier about the 24 hours not you and i but in a previous video we were talking about 24 hour breaks and you know usually it's takatna everyone's talks about takatna um what about for this eight hour mandatory is it, do you feel like there is a difference maker or you know like for example we said okay nick going to crip or going to ruby that's it's a little too late for his 24 does that apply in this scenario with the eight hour um not so much it, it depends a lot upon the dog team and, and the trail conditions at the time um if if the dogs don't need it, then it's a good idea to hold on to it and, and wait to let the trail and, and um, take that recharge as late as possible. Then you're going on to the coast with this charge to dog team as you can have. Um, but if you want to make a move on the river, sometimes it's good to charge them up and be ready for that move. Or if you're needing a recharge after coming across the interior part of the race there, then, you know, Ruby's a really good place to get that recharge before you hit the river you might get some of your speed back um the river is a good place to have speed on because it's flat and fast usually and you can you don't want to be going slow down the river while everyone else is going fast so 
Sure. Uh, real quickly, I want to acknowledge some stuff going on in the chat here. Uh, Mushmo, I don't know if you know him, but Mushmo says he's hopes to see you back on the trail next year, Wade. Um, let's see, there's a couple others here that we're saying. Just jumped in, Jeff. Just jumped in. Hope you hope to see you in the race in, to race the Iditarod again, Wade. Always enjoy cheering for you. Um, so I just figured I would just throw that in there, try to make it a little interactive, get to yeah. hear some, get to hear some of the fan love that you're getting while we're on here. Um, so yeah, just getting back to to this. So, do you think? You know, last year there weren't a lot of uh, Caltag to Unilaclete moves. To my recollection, maybe one or two people. Uh, I know Ryan did it. Um, do you think that we're setting up for for seeing that with Travis and Ryan? Like, do you think we're going to see a couple people try to pull that move? Or, um, you know, I'm, I'm waiting for, like, kind of a power move. Um, do we, do you, do you see that happening? Do you, do you think that Travis might not even need to do that right now with where he's at? He can kind of still be conservative, um, and not have to necessarily do a risky move. Thoughts on that? Yeah, I think Travis is in a good position to put his feet up a little bit and make sure he keeps things strong and, and, um, I don't even know if he needs to quite maintain what he has. He could even get back a little bit at this point. He's got quite a bit of a lead. Um, uh, so as long as things are looking strong, there's no reason why you, sh why you should make a move quite that big. Um, I wouldn't think, but who knows? You know, we'll see what some of these guys do coming out of Ruby and how much of a push they make on the river and how much pressure they're able to put back on him. But, you know, trying to make up that much time, you're usually – hurting a little bit when you get there so when those guys catch back up to travis if they do they're going to be taking some steam out to to do it so sure. um i wouldn't i don't foresee travis making that move i don't know if travis has ever made that move before i think he's a little bit more conservative on that stretch usually so i look for him to stop at old woman and then go over to unicly um i know that ryan really likes going straight to unicly he might do that again if everything's looking good for him when he gets there. The thing about camping on the run from Caltech to Unicleet, I've, I've made that run straight through a few times when I'm racing, and you don't have to carry as much gear and stuff out of Caltech, and there's a lot of big moguls when you leave there, usually pretty slow trail, a lot of rolling hills, stuff like that. So when you carry a load out of there, it can be pretty hard pulling, you know, for the dogs, depending on how strong they are and how big a team you have, et cetera. So going straight through and hauling stuff to camp, both of them can, can gas, you know, take a little gas out of the tank for sure. Gotcha. Um, all right. Well, we've done a little bit of uh, breaking down things at the top, and I did want to – kind of talk a little bit about some of the back of the pack for a second. Um, and I was getting some perspective from my insider and thought I would share some of this and just get some of your um, additional feedback. So just keeping an eye on the back of the pack, we've got this wad of about 10 mushers, mushers, which is a great way to travel together, work together, push each other, watch out for each other. Uh, the concern it, right now this was this person's perspective was about Joshua Robbins. Uh, he needs to do everything in his power to keep up with those other teams. He's stronger with them than without them. And any extra rest he's given his dogs isn't making as much of an impact as the isolation of being in the back alone. Dogs are pack animals and want to be around other dogs. So hopefully he catches up. Um, the other thing that we were that I was getting is that they've got good sized teams and fast traveling speeds for now, so no real concerns. Watching Josh's team leave McGrath last night, they were all going crazy and were nice and fat and healthy. So his team looks good. It's just up to him. 
Um, and then the weather. The weather back here has also been pretty great. 15 to 30 degrees, which is a bit warm for, for some teams. But it's been s snowing very lightly the entire time, which means there is a lot of fresh snow for the dogs to eat to help them stay hydrated and provide some cushion on their feet when running over the hard, frozen, crunchy ice that's formed on the river sections. So a little bit of uh, details there. Um, but yeah, like as you hear that, Wade, what are your thoughts on, you know, just conditions or those mushers in the back? Have you been keeping an eye on any of that? yeah definitely i i do disagree with a little bit of the statement you read <laughs> i like well, to yeah. be a loner uh i like the, i like the loner traveling but uh as far as josh is concerned i do think that he should make a little bit of a move and get back in the group um just for his concern of getting too far behind you know the race has the competitive rule and stuff um one other thing that i i've noticed about teams that are sitting back farther <clears throat> sometimes as they lose their appetites or they, you know, they're just not getting the energy into their bodies because they're not, sometimes you got to give a little bit of a push just to boost that appetite. And um, sometimes sitting around for too, too much, you end up going backwards on that, which is pretty surprising. Um, you think it would be the other way around. The more you rest, the better they things get but sometimes it takes that little bit of a push to get things going metabolism wise etc so yeah if, if if anybody hears this tell josh to to get to get moving <laughs> um he that's a good guy i like that guy he's, he's a fun dude um so i hope he i hope he catches back up and and gets in there and and, and uh, finishes this race and with that being said, it's pretty exciting to see that, you know, there's no scratches yet from any of these guys. Yeah. Yeah. And, um, you know, I watched a couple of his videos, his first video, I think he's like two days in, he has not seen a lick of sleep and, uh, he seemed, seemed a little rough. And then the set, the next one that I saw from him, he, he seemed to have gotten a little more sleep under his belt and have kind of maybe, gotten a bit of a deep breath um but he has he still has good perspective and uh i like what's coming out of his mouth um just uh as sean and i have talked about quite a bit it's not so much uh if his dogs are going to be able to do it it's it's whether the musher can do it and um i sure know he's got a lot of support and a lot of people rooting him on so uh you know we're not hoping for any scratches so we hope that him or anyone else are able to power through um you know still quite a lot of mileage left only 386 in and 589 left on his end um and those at the back so um kind of interesting there you know i do want to also talk you, you said you know you're a loner you you kind of maybe disagree with that statement a little bit the other th side of that that i was thinking about is yes it's nice to travel in a pack but in a way, doesn't that maybe kind of hold you back a little bit if you got that that pack mentality versus, oh, I'm out here all alone. I better get my shit together kind of thing. What, what are your thoughts on that? Yeah, I could definitely. I mean, I think it holds everybody back uh, because when I'm, I'm excelling and you're not and I'm trying to help you, then I'm holding back to help you. And then you might excel in a different spot, but now I'm held back. So you're trying to help me. So usually in the end of even one run, you have went to each other's weaknesses. It's very rare that you go to each other's strengths, you know? Mm -hmm. So, um, you know, if I'm faster in the hills and you're faster on the flats, you've, you've slowed down in the flats so that I can follow along and keep up and, and we can run together. And, and I've slowed down and waited in the hills so that we can run together. So we've, we've raced to each other's weaknesses rather than each other's strengths. So I think that a lot of times traveling with other teams can be pretty detrimental that way, as far as timing on the trail, et cetera. Um, the other thing that I think can be pretty detrimental is, you know, in wind storms or situations where the dogs are having trouble, 
uh, we have a bond with these dogs and they know how to connect to us and we know how to connect to them. And when I'm dealing with my team myself, I can tell them what I need to tell them when I need to tell them it. That's the only thing they hear. It's the only thing they're paying attention to. When there's another team involved, they're telling their dogs things that they want them to pay attention to and hear as well. And that might be offbeat of what I'm saying. Um, so it can throw things off quite a bit out there, especially in tough situations. So that's why I like traveling alone more than anything. Just it makes sense. And are you in general, I, uh, I don't remember. I feel like it was kind of brought into light the year Brent won where he pretty much didn't get to do any checkpoints. What's your, what's your opinion on hitting the checkpoints and resting there versus getting out and doing it in the, in the, in, in between checkpoints on your, on your own? Yeah. I mean, obviously camping out's fun and it's, relaxing probably a little bit more relaxing for the musher and for the dogs in, in a lot of ways but it's a lot less efficient you're losing a lot of time when you come into a checkpoint you have to get all your things together get them packed in your sled leave and then your dogs are pulling that extra load for however many miles you decide to mush outside of a checkpoint so you're you're putting a little extra strain on them doing that and then you have to find somewhere to park if there's not a good parking spot in the area where you want to stop, you have to, you know, use energy and time to create a parking spot uh, to get off of the trail. And then um, if you decide to find a parking spot, you might end up camping a mile or two early on your schedule or pushing a few extra miles to find a good spot. And that can also throw things off quite a bit, even, you know, even adding a few miles in a, in one of your runs um especially hauling the load or in the heat of the day or things like that it can make a big difference in your in the outcome <laughs> right on um <clears throat> so a question from one of our viewers Lori is curious she's first of all she said that she always enjoyed following your Iditarod runs and she hopes that your dogs overall are well especially those with Ryan and Jason Jason, she's wondering about if there's any update on those dogs. Are they still on the line? Um, have you been in touch with any of them? How are your dogs doing out there? Yeah, well, we just watched Jason come into Ruby, and he had uh, Bowie and Kaiser in lead. Those are two dogs from us. Um, he had Brittany in swing. He had Tika and China two behind swing and then Ventana right behind that. So um, every dog that of ours that Jason started with is still in the team. They looked happy and strong coming into the checkpoint. His whole team looked very happy, smile and faces and, and, and good. Um, Ryan has ran uh, Gary in lead quite a bit this race. He did not have him in lead coming into, into Ruby. But uh, he, I think he was in swing, or actually he's a little farther back in the team this time. He brought one of his back of the team dogs up to lead. So, uh, but Gary's still in there. Julius is still in there, and Randall's still in there, and they all look looking good on video anyway, from what we've seen. So, um, we haven't heard any. I I have been talking to Ryan a little bit, but I he, we haven't talked too much about the dogs. Just mostly, uh, what's going on out there. So. Nice. Yeah. And actually, I'm glad I'm glad you mentioned that. Like, uh, obviously, the rules are that you can be in touch with folks, um, you know. Uh, so you like, are you in touch also with Travis as well as Ryan or, you know, are, are they do you talk to him daily? Can you tell us a little bit about that? I've only talked to Travis once a little bit earlier in the race. Maybe I think going from Nikolai to McGrath, he gave me a call. Um, Ryan, I've talked to you quite a bit more, uh, almost okay. every run I've talked to Ryan a little bit. So yeah. how's he say, and how, how does he sound? He sounds good. I, I don't know what his thoughts are yet or not, or if things are coming together for him, but he's definitely looking at a couple of different aspects. It's really hard to tell with these mushers because they're really good at playing head games with themselves. So, you know, one run's like, oh, man, I just don't have it this year. And the next run's like, I'm going to run them all over. And 
So, you know, it, it goes back and forth. But uh, overall, I think both of them sound, sound really good. Nice, nice. Uh, I appreciate you just even answering that question. Um, <laughs> so in terms of are you – do you have any idea of how the weather is looking and shaping up over the next couple of days? I haven't looked at the weather, actually. I did hear a rumor that it was supposed to cool down, get down to like negative 15 or something like that. So – um, that'd be really nice for everybody if it did cool down a little bit for sure. Um, but I haven't looked at it personally. So, yeah. Can you just talk about that? So if that is, that's also what I've heard, that's going to be, you know, negative 15, negative 20. Um, that's more ideal for the dogs, correct? Absolutely. Yeah. And the musher, I think. So, you know, when we're out there, we have our gear on and everything and we're running up hills and trying to pump, especially you know, coming out of Caltag, especially because it, it's a pretty hilly section and the dogs aren't a hundred percent energy anymore. So you want to help them out and pick up pennies is kind of the way we talk about it. And, um, so, you know, if it's 15, 20 below, you can do that without getting too hot and sweaty. And, um, which just makes you feel horrible when you're hot and sweaty <laughs> They should not really want to work too much, but also for the dogs, absolutely. They like that colder weather. They have thick coats on them and uh, of fur and, and um, stuff. So they, I would say 15 to 20 below is their preferred temperature for running. And the other thing that that can do is harden up the trail <clears throat> at a colder temperature and, and make the, the plastics a little easier sliding on the trail and stuff like that. So it can, it can make a really big difference, the, the temperature and the weather out there. And so hopefully if it cools down, it kind of benefits everyone. The mushers are happy. The dogs are happy. The MPHs are maybe a, a little bit high, higher, right? Yep. Yep, definitely. Um, definitely usually see a little more speeds with, with, uh, with colder weather just because the dogs are feeling better. And, again, the trail's hardening up usually on that, in that regard. So. Nice. Nice. All right. Um, so I was breaking down Travis's rest run schedule and, um, let's see, he, he's had about 10 runs so far. Um, but I was curious, he had a few, like he had an eight and a half hour run into his 24 hour. So that kind of makes sense um and then out of his 24 hour he had like a six hour and a six hour and a quarter run with a three hour 45 minute rest and then into an eight hour and 15 minute run with a four hour rest and i guess i'm curious is it the rule of thumb is like you kind of want to rest about two or three hours less than what you ran yeah, I would say it's probably more of a percentage thing than a set thing in that way. So maybe, you know, it used to be back in the day 50-50. Now it's kind of 75% maybe or something. So if you run eight hours, you rest for maybe, sorry, let me, let me rephrase that. Back in the day, it used to be even run, even rest. So you would run six hours you'd rest six hours now it's more 50 50 where you run eight rest four or maybe a little bit less than that usually i think six hour runs four hour rest seven hour runs or something like that so gotcha yeah, yeah travis definitely made a little bit of a push there on that section coming out of his 24 um like i said earlier it was a risky move to get out that far in front but it might be a risk that pays off because now he can put his feet up and kind of manage the dog team and and just run them to a nice even bait, you know, beat and and uh, not worry too much about it. So that that move could pay off a lot as long as it didn't take too much steam out of the team for sure. So I guess to kind of follow up on that, like, you know, if you have a couple of runs where you're doing half of what you half the rest to what you ran, at some point it catches up, right? Like. Um, I would assume he's going to probably have like maybe a little bit of a longer 
rest coming up at some point, you know, with a, an eight hour and a quarter, then he did seven and three quarters. Um, but the rest is like four hours. I'm just, I, I'm just like, I'm trying to figure it out in my head. Like, you know, I know that I was breaking down, uh, like Dallas's it's like, you know, he, he's got like a five hour run with a two hour rest. And then he's got a six hour run with a three hour rest. So it's like, he goes up an hour in the run. He goes up an hour in the rest. I was just kind of like looking at the difference of people and how they like attack that, you know? Yeah. Yeah. I think Travis kind of flying by the seat of his pants at the moment. <laughs> um, I, I, is what it seems like to me, but, um, you know, that might be a really good thing. That's Travis's style. Um, and usually we see it more from him on the coast, just kind of moves and stuff. So uh, it'll be interesting to see how it plays out doing it this early. Um, but again, he's got a big gap that he can relax and he's got his eight hour break coming up. So he can hopefully recover everything that that came out of the dogs. He can hopefully recover it all on the eight. They maybe do some short runs with a little bit longer rests just to keep them strong and, but stay out in front there. So, Got you. Well, I'm hoping for uh, an exciting finish. Um, you know, last year there was quite a bit of excitement, like getting right to the coast. And then like Ryan made that, that big push and um, Pete kind of backed off there at a Koyuk or whatever it was. And uh, so I'm hoping like, there's some excitement, you know, in three days down the road that um, that we can be talking about. You know, one thing, Sean and I, we we had a video where we broke down some of the rules uh, surrounding the Iditarod. And one thing that was pretty interesting to me, at least, is the no man's land rule. And then I was talking to Sean, like, talk to me about that. He's like, so essentially uh, up until the very like right outside of Nome. <clears throat> If a musher is coming up on another team, the team in front has to move over and let them go by. But with no man's land, you can just race. You can go right neck. And Sean was saying that only one time has it actually even like needed to have, you know, two teams racing on no man's land. Um, I guess that's like everyone's dream. But it, ultimately, it would just be cool to see two teams, no matter what place they are. Yeah. going head to head out there you know i i i loved watching the end of um what was it i love seeing emily pass brant earlier in what was that the under there yep and then even the uh, what was the race for fourth and fifth place between travis and amanda that was so exciting yeah. to watch so um I'm, I'm hoping that there are some exciting finishes towards the end um, if you had to put your money on someone right now, are you putting it on Travis? Are you, do you still think there's too much, there's too much mileage to safely put your money on someone? What are your thoughts on that? <laughs> yeah, I do think there's too much mileage to safely put your money on someone, but I would like to put my money on Travis right now at this point for sure. Um, that's a hard one to say <laughs> for sure. Um, now, as far as the no man's land thing goes, there have been quite a few races of no man's land um, into Nome, just only one of them ever in first and second place. Uh, gotcha. There was a couple guys that were really well known for blowing by teams from safety to Nome, and that was the Smith brothers. They would, they have some really fast runs from safety to Nome, and they would pass a lot of teams and. Um, I believe they've passed a few teams on Front Street before. Um, oh, wow. I know one year, I can't remember if it was Sam or Ramey, they came up onto Front Street. I think it was right behind Paul Gebhardt. And the cop car started up and followed Paul Gebhardt, not realizing that the one of the Smith boys was right there, and it cut off the team, and the team went down a side road, and they got pretty messed up. And, and Paul ended up keeping his finishing place, but... Um, so there's been some pretty interesting deals right there at the finish and that would be really fun to see again this year for sure. Yeah, 
Yeah, it would be. Um, the other thing that kind of caught my eye, I was going through and I was just kind of taking an inventory on dogs. And mm -hmm. most teams have a good amount of dogs. Um, but I was a little concerned with Anna, Anna Barrington. She only had 10. And that was when we recorded our video yesterday. Um, yeah. So for anyone who's tuning in and who is kind of like me and seeing that, um, you know, being that early in the race, being down to 10 dogs, talk to us about that. I mean, yeah, it's a, it's surprising to me that she is. I know that they usually field two teams and this year they're only fielding one team. So it's a little bit surprising to see her down uh already <laughs> excuse me um but uh it's not really concerning at all if they're 10 really good dogs uh back to those smith boys i've seen sim smith leave galena with i think it was six dogs one time and he was in 30 something place and ended up finishing in the top 10 with those six dogs um wow so uh, I've also seen Mike Williams Jr. take off from Unicleet with six and jump Shag Tulik, go all the way to Quaya, jump Elam and go all the way to White Mountain with six dogs and, and blow by a lot of teams. So if you're willing to put in the work behind the sled and you have a really good dog team, it's not too concerning to get down on dog numbers. Um, the only reason why we have such big numbers of dogs, such a big team, is so that we can return those dogs at any site of them needing to be returned. So she's obviously doing a good job sending dogs home that, that need to be sent home. So um, no, not taking any chances or, or risks at bringing them along with her. So. Sure. And I guess um, there is also an element of, you know, it makes the chores a little bit quicker going having only 10 versus 16, right? I mean, that's, uh, what's the math? 24 less pause to do booty up yeah. and, and rub down and, and all of that. Um, you know, to my knowledge, the Barrington tw twins have great, uh, dog care. So, um, I don't, it's not necessarily alarming. I just was uh, surprised to see that number early on, but, you know, obviously, if something's up with the dogs, it's it's in the dog's best interest and the team's best interest to do what you have to do. Um, Absolutely. Have you have you had to make have there are there difficult decisions to be made about dropping dogs or is it kind of like, OK, that one's not performing as well. We're going to drop them or c kind of talk to me a little bit about the mentality of how you make that decision of dropping a dog. Yeah, I mean, it's it's uh, usually cut and dry. Um, you're only as fast as your slowest dog. It's usually cut and dry on that. Uh, but not always. Um, I'm one that doesn't use much in the way of wraps and massages and all this kind of stuff. If they're starting to get sore, they're usually just going to continue down that road. They're going to take away from your sleep break. They're going to take away from your care on the rest of the team, et cetera. So usually it's smarter to just send them home and, and move on. Um, as far as I'm concerned, you're not, you know, you're not pushing that dog past its limits in that, in those regards. And then, uh, like I said, you're being able to pay more attention to the rest of the team and you're being able to take better care of yourself when you're not out there doing all of that every time. Gotcha. Gotcha. A um, couple of questions have come in and I want to refer to those. So we've got one from Jack here. And so it's, it's uh, in reference to the Dallas interview. Uh, so seeing okay. Dallas's interview, appreciating Rob's recent vulnerability. Yesterday, Rob Cook was on. We kind of talked a little bit about mental health and such. Um, and you were also referring to musher head games. What are your experiences with mental anguish and dealing with it either on or off the trail? Yeah. I mean, when you're on the trail, it's really easy to 
think things that aren't real. So, for instance, when you're going to a checkpoint, I remember, you know, uh, going to Ruby yeah, on the Fairbanks route. I think it was 2017. Um, I thought I was going so slow and everything was falling apart. And I got to Ruby and I declared my 24 because the dogs were going so slow and everything else. And Dallas was right behind me when, you know, I think I passed him on the trail that year, headed over to Ruby. That was the year I got first to Ruby. And it turned out that I'd put like 10 miles on him in that run. And I thought I was walking the whole time. I thought I was going so slow. But in reality, per the trail conditions, I was going really fast. So you end up running into a lot of those situations where you just, you get into your own head and you think that the dogs aren't really putting it out there and all this stuff. And then you get to the checkpoint and they're like, man, you had the fastest run time of everybody. You, you were flying out there and you're like, uh, oops, I guess I should have relaxed a little more and, and, and not got in my own head. So there's quite a bit of that on the race for sure. Um, other than that, I don't know. I'm I'm pretty pretty laid back person. Don't worry too much about things. So. Gotcha. Um, so on that note, I was curious, just hearing you kind of starting to answer that question. Um, do you heal, do you suffer from hallucinations when you're dealing with the sleep de sleep deprivation out there on the trail? Surprisingly, no. I don't know that I've ever hallucinated. Really, I think I my biggest problem has been thinking i'm hallucinating and then in reality i'm not hallucinating <laughs> so the first time i saw like i iti guys on the trail i thought for sure i was hallucinating and i kept slapping myself in the face and telling myself there wasn't people walking up the river and then in reality there was people walking up the river <laughs> uh that was before i really had much knowledge of what iti was so I've had moments, quite a few moments like that, where I thought I was hallucinating. Uh, one year I was going through a uh, rainy pass, actually, it was early in the race, and there was a set of eyeballs coming down off the hill towards me, and I thought for sure it was a wolf, and then I said, oh, you're just getting in your head, there's no wolves, that, you know, just thought a wolf getting ready to attack you, and closer it got, I'm thinking, man, this is actually a wolf getting ready to attack me, oh, I'm hallucinating, and Somehow one of my dogs had gotten loose from the front of my team. It was windy enough that I couldn't see it. And they'd went on, went the wrong way up the side of the hill and they came back down to meet the team. So I thought I was hallucinating there as well and turned out to be reality. So I had quite a few of those experiences, but never really much of real hallucinations. Well, I would say that you're lucky. Sean and I have spent some time talking about his hallucinating out there. He, there's one story that kind of sticks out to me where essentially like the tunnel vision, essentially it's like he, he can only see in like this small hole, no matter what he's doing. It's like, and uh, you know, and then he's like, um, I was seeing mom while I was out there and I was seeing you and I was seeing my girlfriend. <laughs> it's just, yeah. like, um, awesome. so yeah, it's just, it's, uh, it's, really interesting to me to see how different mushers handle it and um you know like last year i know everyone was making a big deal about eddie falling off dealing with the sleep deprivation i i know i saw someone else this year fell off the sled did you catch that story or did you was that more recently that was like today i i did i just don't yeah, remember who ryan. it was oh it was ryan yeah do you have uh do you have any uh details on that? And all all I, I heard was he fell off and I think yeah. uh was it Paige that picked him up, I believe? Yep. Yep, she gave him a little ride. I think it was only a couple miles that ended up they ended up getting away from him for just a couple miles. So I did not get any details on what happened there, how he fell off or anything. Yet. <laughs> I'm sure there's a yeah. uh, I'm sure there's an insider video to to be seen coming down the road where yeah. maybe he uh, gives us a little details on that. Um, Definitely. Let's see. Okay, so this is a not 
related to this year's race? This is just a general question. I'm kind of interested to get your perspective on this. I know that you have been, you're not a musher representative, but you've been in the past. Is that right? Yes. Okay. So, you know, your opinion on certain matters is certainly interesting to hear given that. Um, so what is your perspective on the future of the Iditarod? The entries mm. have decreased, higher entry fees, decreased purses. Will the race be able to attract new fans and sponsors down the road? Shout out to Kat for that question. Yeah. Um, they have a lot of work to do. Um, I think that behind the scenes, Rob Urbach has been doing a pretty good job of bringing things back together. He was handed a little bit of a mess, and he has done a pretty good job of keeping it together, pulling some things back together, et cetera. Um, yeah, it's a hard situation, you know, with with some of the different aspects that are hammering against Iditarod and such things. Um, they, they definitely have a lot of work to do to attract people, attract sponsors. I think that it is possible to turn this race around and have it you know, thriving within the next few years. There's a lot of ideas out there, a lot of different insights. They just got the uh, gambling thing going um, that that they have now, the lottery. So, you know, hopefully that starts hitting hard and taking off. That'll help a lot with finances and stuff like that. Uh, if that can, can get a little bit bigger. Can you, I, so, I'm not fully following that. Can you give a little more detail in terms of the gambling? You're, are you talking about it being legal in Alaska and that money would help the race or? Yeah, they were, they were given the gambling license. So right now there's the Alaska lotto that goes on. There has been the Alaska lotto that's went on for many years. And, um, the Iditarod was given the same gaming license last year or this last summer, and they launched their own um, gambling lottery site. Okay. So they do pretty much you can buy a ticket for, I can't remember how much tickets are, $10 a piece or something, and then they do a purse every week where they draw it out of it. And uh, right now they have a grand prize purse this March that's been building for since they got this thing going. So there's pretty big, pretty, pretty big prize. that's going to happen. I think when in Nome, they're going to do the drawing possibly uh, after the race finishes. So if you haven't bought your tickets for the lottery, you should, you should get on that. Oh, sure. there it is. Um, yeah. A little plug coming from Wade. I love it. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> um, you know, they're also doing a lot of improvement on the insider and stuff like that. Um, the main thing is going to be doing improvements on advertising the insider and getting more subscriptions in there. They they are doing a lot of improvements within the within the insider program itself. They are doing a really good job, and every year it seems like they learn something new and try something different. So if you haven't got insider either, here's another plug. You should <laughs> subscribe for that. And check Let's it out. Let's go. Yeah. And let yeah. me uh let me add to that, Wade. So, um you know, Sean's out there working with the insider. It's natural for me to plug it because it's related to my brother, but let me just remove Sean for a second. Um, for me, the last few years, you know, I've at times I've been like, where is more content? And so I'm not going to dwell on the past, but what I am talking about is 2024. I did a rod. I think they've been on point. Every time I'm logging on, I've got new videos to watch. I've got new content to watch. Um, in years past, and maybe, I, well, you've been out on the trail, so you probably don't know the answer to this, but for me, watching uh, checkpoint cams has been virtually useless in the past because uh, unless you were watching the team come in or out, you, there was not much to see. Um, having Sean out there and others who are actively moving the camera around, zooming in and out, narrating what they're seeing, interacting with people that are on the chat, um, which Sean was like, the chat is a crazy world. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> but um, 
uh, that was a long story to say, uh, you know, we are fully supporting the insider and it's not too late to sign up. And, um, I, we, we, we had Greg on and, uh, you know, we were chatting with him when we weren't recording. And, and one thing that people may or may not be aware of is the insider, the money that they, that they make from that is directly helping to support the race. And he was talking yeah. about like, if you take the insider out of the mix, the race might not have a lot of legs to stand on because it really does bring in a considerable amount of money. So um, I'm glad to see that they've made those changes, those uh, upgrades, or they've brought in Sean or Katie Joe. Um, I've also noticed like the use of drones and stuff. And yeah. so we like to see that and, you know, updated, uh, like they've got the updated tracker and like you can watch the live cam and tracker at the same time. So we're doing our best to give the Iditarod um, the insider a, uh, a plug here. And yes. with that, I think we're pretty good. Close to wrapping up. I am curious. So I've got, a, I've got two questions unless someone throws a, another one our way. Outside of that top group, is there anyone it, that's maybe in the 20s or 30s right now that you might ex- see make a big push and all of a sudden they're like, wait, how did Amanda Otto get to top 10? How did – I'm just filling in the blanks here. I'm just guessing. How did Joseph yeah. Tier get to 12th or whatever? Right. Do you see any moves like that down the road uh, lining up? Yeah, definitely a couple for sure. I think, you know, we can see Aaron Burmeister make a big move at some point here. Um, of course, if everything's going good for him, I think he'll make a big move. Jesse Royer could make a big move here at some point. Um, and then there's always just the random people that squeeze up there. And uh, when people start to fade, they just keep getting up and going and they end up passing up, you know, I've been known to do that a few times where don't have the best race ever, but I just keep up getting up and going and, and some people aren't in, in position to do that. So, that, so I ended up reeling them in. So uh, I do look for a few people to do that. Probably Amanda Otto's or yeah, Amanda Otto's probably setting up really well for a push later. And some of those guys like that, that are, that have been conservative and pl- playing it easy that, that are ready to rumble at some point here and, but the main two I'd keep my eye on is, is Burmeister and, and, uh, and Royer. Okay. Regard. All right. You heard it here first. Look out for those <laughs> two. Um, and then the last question is actually not related to dog mushing, but uh, just kind of curious. Uh, this came in from Jeff. What are some of your favorite things to do outside of mushing, outside of working with your dogs? Just kind of curious to – to hear some of your things that you like to do. I would, I would guess, let me just throw this out there. Uh, mm-hmm. because you and I have children about the same age, you've got two, I've only got one, but I'm sure a lot of your time is spent, uh, with them. Um, but yeah, yeah just any thoughts on your hobbies and your children or anything else? Yeah, that's changed a lot since I had kids. You know, now I I mostly uh, enjoy building Lego towers and um, throwing little foam footballs, playing with remote control cars. <laughs> wow. <laughs> Watching Blippy and uh, oh, Bluey. nice. Yep. <laughs> yeah, yep. Yeah. That me too. Yeah. yeah. Um, no, but I, I enjoy, uh, hunting and four wheeling stuff like that, snowmobiling. Um, so yeah, but, but the majority of my time at the moment is being spent on, on, uh, reliving my childhood. (laughs) I love it. Did you guys go through a Miss Rachel phase? Oh yes. Miss Rachel, for sure. We've, uh, she's on the, on the side burner for now, but as soon as Asher's big enough, she'll be right back in the mix for sure. That is yeah. so funny. That is so funny. We did a family vacation last year. Sean was there and Sean was like, I'm going to kill myself if I have to keep watching Miss Rachel. And I'm just like, dude, my son Hatcher is absolutely 
like zoned in and he's happy oh, yeah. and that's that so they learn they learn a lot from miss rachel too she's very good influence on on the kids so nice i love i show. love how we i love how we're uh ending on the topic of <laughs> of what shows we watch uh we let our our children watch um, yeah actually we just did a, a puppy litter they're about six months old seven months old now and there's blippy and bluey and bingo and bandit and barbie so our yep. five puppies names so oh nice oh okay i see what you did there you did a kennel after yeah. okay nice that's Matt too got funny to name the puppies <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> how cute i love it um <laughs> Well, Wade, I can't thank you enough for your time, for breaking things down and answering some of the questions that we got in the chat today. Um, I really appreciate the time you spent with me. I do want to quickly plug our um, our interview tomorrow. We, uh, you know, I've got a lot on my plate here, y'all. And I know I haven't talked about every single musher. And I do understand that some of you probably want to hear some of the other folks and on that note, I'm super excited that tomorrow we have Josh McNeil on. Um, you know, he obviously had his injury earlier this year and he had to withdraw from the Iditarod, but uh, I'm excited to get his perspective on things because Wally Robinson is running his dogs and he's doing a fine job of it as well. And so I'm really excited to kind of hear his breakdown and perspective on, on his dogs and how Wally's doing and, and everything else. Um, so thank you guys again for tuning in today. This is, uh, it's been a lot of fun and getting better and having a lot of fun doing it. Um, if, if you haven't yet, please make sure you are subscribed to our YouTube page. I'm not trying to say that too often, but we do have this goal that we're trying to reach and we are so darn close and really would appreciate it. Um, but outside that of that, we're going to send this thing to end and, um, yeah, thank you guys for watching today.